Okay, so we're gonna look through the dog's eyes and, and get a better understanding of the canine perspective. Um, I'm gonna talk about ontogeny, um, so you get a better idea where dogs came from, right? Um, and we wanna really understand the dog's perspective, knowing where they came from, knowing where they are today. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about how dogs learn and give you some practical applications to learning theory. So with ontogeny, what I'm gonna go through today um, it's going to be domestication, so we'll look at the domestication of the dog, and we're going to compare and contrast that domestication with other species. Um, we're going to look at development, developmental periods of dogs, and what can go wrong with those developmental periods. I'll talk to you about social behavior of dogs, their sensory perception. They obviously see the world much differently than we do, and what those differences are, and we'll make some comparisons to humans, too, as well. And then we're going to look at canine communication, okay? So we'll look at the wild ancestor of the dog. We're gonna look at domestication. Um, we're gonna look at how domestication can in influence the behavior of dogs and, and what changes were associated with domestication. And then we're gonna compare wolves, foxes, and dogs and use them as evidence of domestication. So the wild ancestor of the domestic dog is the wolf, the gray wolf. Um, some common characteristics of the gray wolf. So um, essentially most of them are gray. They could be tawny gray in color, um, anywhere from um, brown uh, to uh, buff type color, so a light tan type color. Um, but they may be really any color from solid white to solid black varieties that you will see. Um, and some common characteristics is that they're gonna have a facial mask. Um, you can think about the facial mask as some of our Arctic type breed dogs, right? Um, so our facial mask right here. Um, and they, they usually have a black tip on the tip of their tail. So there's some common characteristics. They're actually very large individuals. Um, they're about 32 to 34 inches at the shoulder. So that's almost three feet tall, right, at the shoulder. So that's a pretty big individual. Um, they're quite long, three to five feet in length, and they have long furry tails, maybe one to two feet in length. So um, they're quite big animals. Weight-wise, males, anywhere from 70 to 145 pounds. Females are gonna be slightly smaller, 60 to 100 pounds. And generally when we think about um, wolves, as well as we think about many other species, the more we go to the poles, like we go up north to Antarctica, or, to, or I should say south to Antarctica, north up to Alaska, um, generally the larger the individual. As we go more towards the equator with most animals, they're gonna shrink in size. So that's also associated with temperament, right? Or excuse me, temperature. Um, so polar bears are gonna be much larger than our brown bears. Um, coyotes are gonna be much smaller than um, our Arctic wolves. And diet-wise, they're primarily carnivores. Um, so they primarily eat meat, they work together, function as a pack, and they can actually take down really large prey, such as moose, which can be actually seven feet tall. Um, they can eat 20 pounds of food in a setting. So think about if your dog got into a 20 pound bag of food, right? And ate that in one setting, that's a lot of food, right? Um, uh, and uh, so they're pretty successful as hunters can take actually down large prey, but they also may take down smaller prey too as well. Um, mice, rodents, rabbits um, as well. So on the picture on the left, we have the gray wolf, a gray variety. Um, and then we've selected some domestic dogs to look very much like wolves. So here we have a Czechoslovakian wolf dog. Um, it was a, a breed of dog that was um, an experiment done in Czechoslovakia um, in about 1950s. And what they did is they actually bred German shepherds with wolves, and they were trying to get some of the beneficial characteristics of domestic dogs, as well as some of the health benefits that we have um, of wolves. And these were um, Kasparian wolves that they bred them with. Um, and they were selected for use in the military for working dogs, for working ability. So we have some dogs that are domesticated today that were pretty recently bred with wolves um, for behavior. And of course they look phenotypically very wolf-like. Now we have other domesticated dogs that also look wolf-like. Um, this is a Belgian Malinois. This is actually my dog, Polo. And so you can see several similar behavioral characteristics. He's about 85 pounds. Um, and uh, you know, 
dogs that look more wolf-like also tend to be more predatory. And we've selected for predatory ability in working dogs um, because we have a way that we can motivate them. So, you know, some of our domestic dogs are going to look very wolf-like. They're going to look very wild-type, right, um, in their characteristics. Now, on the other hand, the flip side of the coin, we've selected some breeds of dogs for genetic abnormalities, for, for uniqueness. So look at the example of the English Bulldog. So um, any dog that has the absence of a tail or that has a curled tail, essentially that's a spinal defect. And they've selected for that, just for that type of look. Um, dogs that show brachycephaly, that have a short, shortened muzzle, um, that's a genetic defect that has been selected for dogs. And with some of those genetic defects, we can have problems, right? English Bulldogs are well known to have many medical problems, so things like stenotic nares, difficulty breathing, um, elongated soft palate, um, sometimes they have an underbite where their teeth are exposed, um, skin fold dermatitis associated around the face, um, entropion where their really wrinkled face and their eyelids actually roll in and they need to have surgery to, to correct that. So um, we've selected some breeds of dogs for specific genetic abnormalities that we feel are cute, right? 